You thought that you could have it all And life could be a ball But you fell and scabbed your knee Now you can be free Welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Derek. I am the recovering CEO and I'm pleased to welcome you. This is actually our first official video podcast. We have a very special guest all the way from California. Uh, his name is Dr. Don Grant. He's an internationally award-winning media psychologist, published researcher, doctoral addictions counselor, and educator with specific expertise in technology's impact on mental health. And how are you doing today, Dr. Grant? I'm still here, so I'm good. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. You know, and as you know, on the Recovering CEO, we talk about recovery and addiction. Um, I think we talked about it a little bit. You know, I'm in recovery. I know you're also in recovery as well. Is that true? Yeah, I've been. Uh, my sobriety date is August 26, 2001. So for okay. a minute, just yeah. for a minute. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So, I think, you know, the reason we do the recovering CEO is really to help people. And we've never really talked to anyone who deals with uh, device management addiction. And I know that's just a growing, growing area. Um, t tell me a little bit, how did you get into that? Uh, and why are you so passionate about it? Sure. I, I would love as you know, I would love to take credit that this was some idea that I'm some Nostradonis. Yeah, that's a joke on my name, Don. I would love to tell you that, but it's just not true. So, you know, as people in recovery, <laughs> we have to be rigorously honest or I'm going to have to call my sponsor, <laughs> which I always try to avoid. I never want to do that, which keeps me kind of within our code. Uh, so I'd love to take credit that I suddenly had this uh, epiphany. I didn't at all. So I am what is called or what we call a digital immigrant. Do you know what a digital immigrant is, Derek? Have you um, heard that? I'm not sure. Why don't you okay. uh, help me? <laughs> yeah. I don't. Sure. So there's digital immigrants and digital natives is what we call them. I'm a digital immigrant, meaning that I did not grow up with computers in an Xbox. It was computers came along at a certain point in my life. So I had to make the decision to bridge the chasm and decide, was I going to start learning about them? And so it just is something that I it wasn't I wasn't my uh, my born right to just have uh, all of these things. Right. Yep. However. I am the father of the first generation of digital natives. So my two daughters are digital natives. They do not know a world without iPhones and, and, and Playstations and Spotify, and they don't know that. Yeah. So I try to be a good dad. And my, I'm not gonna lie, my princesses, my two daughters are amazing. They have me wrapped around their fingers. <laughs> And they can pretty much get anything they want out of me, but they deserve it. They're great. Uh, so at a certain point, one of them came to me and she wanted this thing. And it was called an iPhone. Yep. I don't know about anything about that. What we knew, and I'll, I'm going to test you a little bit. Okay. The thing that I knew, which changed our worlds, was something called the BlackBerry. Now, Derek, do you remember what people called the Blackberry? Yes, the Crackberry. Is that the right? Crackberry. And certainly <laughs> those of us in recovery, because this is something that everyone said. So those of us in recovery were kind of like, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> we get it. But we thought it was funny. Looking back, now we're like, Oh my gosh, we didn't even know what was coming. Because that's what I knew. And the Blackberry was great. But then this iPhone came out in 2008. And my daughter wanted one. Well, okay. So I got it for her. And something happened very quickly that we now know, or we could call it a form of cyberbullying. It was, it was, she was left out of a picture that all her friends had gone to the beach and written BFF. And she was not told about this excursion and she saw it and it caused some feelings, let's just say. And I realized that I had handed my daughter a potential weapon that I did not understand. And so I needed as a good dad to understand it. I mean, I'm not going to give my daughter a set of power tools right. without knowing 
what how they work and and offering some safety. But we didn't know. None of us knew. So uh, kind of like Newton discovered gravity. Hashtag fake news. Uh, do you remember how the story goes? How Newton discovered gravity? Yeah, an apple fell off the tree and hit him in the head. Metaphorically, the same thing happened to me. The apple was an Apple iPhone. It fell out of a digital tree and hit me in the head. I'm gonna. I would love, like I said, to take credit. It was not that. It was just timing. And I realized that I needed to know about this thing. I was just trying to be a good father. I started looking into what this thing was. I'd handed her and what it could do. And 14 years later, I get to talk to people like you and get to do all of these things. In the meantime, I have researched. I have published. There were many years, I'm not going to lie, where I was wondering and concerned you people weren't going to care as I'm going out and talking about this and talking about this. And I'm looking at people who are looking back at me going, what? Uh, and But I also, at the same time, entered a doctoral program. And so I dedicated my doctoral work to become a media psychologist. And this has been kind of the journey. But that's how it all started. Yeah. It was because of my kid and the apple. And yeah. what I will say is that I don't think I was wrong. All those years I was sweating it and worrying, did you people care about this? I don't think I was wrong. And if the pandemic taught us anything, now I think that, you know, it's been evidence what will happen if we become too reliant on these things. Now, I want to say something I say in every presentation, yeah. every one of these kind of things. I am not anti-technology. I use it all the time. The fact that we can use it right now and spread the word is amazing. I am not at all anti-technology. I teach healthy device management and the practice of good digital citizenship. So I look at these devices as tools. Yeah. And a tool, a hammer is a tool. It can build a house. It can destroy a house. So I just want to make that clear because sometimes people think, oh, he's the anti-guy or, or they put it in recovery terms. Oh, you're talking abstinence from, okay, really abstinence from technology. <laughs> How is right. that even possible? That's not reasonable. I want to make that clear. Yeah. You know, before you go further, uh, first, I want to commend you for being a good dad. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I remember because I have two daughters. You, you too. tell my kids that. When yeah. They're angry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have two daughters, too. And, uh, you know, one of my greatest regrets or really one of my wife's greatest regrets was giving them an iPhone so young because you think it's a privilege mm -hmm. to give your kid an iPhone young, but then they just like fall into it. It's like falling into the black hole. So, we didn't know. Yeah, we didn't know. We, we didn't know. We still, you know, the fact that I'm able, because I'm going to tell you, uh, I took out, you know, th th this was a pretty extensive endeavor when I went back to get my PhD in this. And uh, it was a few student loans. And if I was wrong about this, of the many fails of my life, if I was wrong and it invested all of that, it would have been probably one of the most epic fails. So the fact that people don't know, but that now they're interested, thank goodness for me, because I really was uh, concerned about it. But now don't don't beat yourself up. We didn't know. Yeah. Parents still, I do parent groups all the time. They still don't know because we're digital immigrants. Yeah, well, I'm an immigrant too. So tell me about how has the pandemic, you know, everyone's staying at home, uh, lack of socializing, how has that impacted device use over the last few years? Sure. Um, you know, I'm going to say this first. Thank goodness we had it because the idea of not being able to be connected, if we hadn't had these, these things that would have, you know, I, I don't know what that would have looked like, but I will tell you that one of the things that happened was that uh, what I'm working on now, I should say is we became so reliant and people were investing, investigating and started utilizing platforms and apps that they never would have or they'd resisted. But because of the pandemic, we were forced to. So what I'm looking at now, Derek, a lot and have been looking at and throughout the pandemic was what of our behaviors around devices are going to end up being short-term forced adaptations to connect and what are gonna end up being lifestyle adoptions. So that's the thing and trying to untether to help people remember the valence, vitality, and value of IRL, as the kids say, in real life connection. But there was a lot of uh, uh, behaviors that, as media psychologists and people who do what I do, knew were coming, but we thought we had about 10 years to get ahead of it. 
what happened was that the pandemic and the confinement collapsed that time. So I'm just going to give you some examples. Certainly academics, the idea that school can now be online. The idea that the prejudice against online, especially universities, oh, you went to what school and it wasn't brick and mortar, that's removed, which is great because it opens up a lot of higher education yeah. for, for more people. Commerce, shopping, uh, communication, certainly. Business, and I don't know that we're ever gonna return to the before times. Certainly things with work. You know, the employers were never equipped to do have people work from home or even do a hybrid. But now it has been proven because it was forced to that it can work. And what's gonna happen is the digital natives are going to be the decision makers in a few years. And they lived through knowing that working from home and hybrid work can work. So any of us who are resistant, those of us like, no, you gotta go in the office, you gotta be in the office five days a week. We're not going to be the decision makers and they have evidence themselves and they want to, even my own kids. They're like, oh, you know, I could work. I don't like going in the office every day. And they've seen that the efficacy of it and it could be successful. So that will change. What is lost? Well, certainly connection. Certainly, I mean, there's the, the tsunami of emails and the lack of boundaries. Now 24 seven ways to communicate with us and we're all gotten used to emailing even through work 24 seven and threads that just go on forever instead of just walking across all or picking up the phone. Uh, so we've become really comfortable and even those like us digital immigrants who said, for example, I heard this a lot, I would never grocery shop. I like to pick the tomato. Well, during the pandemic, those of us who really weren't facile with these platforms and apps suddenly were forced to use them. And now I'm wondering, will we return? Um, I use this example. There's certain things that I'm very concerned about and I've been concerned about for a long time and call me an emo, call me a nerd, I don't care. I will hold to the written love letter, photo albums and pictures that are actually hanging on my wall Thank you notes that are written. I had to write them as a kid. Uh, so these things, you don't miss what you don't know. So I'm worried, and I've been worried all along before the pandemic about some of the things that the digital natives just don't know or don't see the value of. Yep. And I'll Pinterest that, I'll get back to that in a second because what I wanted to uh, really promote is the idea that if we do not see the value of something, then we're not going to invest in it. So as we start to get moved back out into the world, and certainly in over here, I don't think you'll disagree with this, I hope not. My belief, and I know I'm not the only one who shares this, that in terms of recovery, connection, human connection is the antidote for addiction. And ironically, my first research study, Derek, that was published mm -hmm. was back in the day. And I did an investigation in comparison of face-to-face -face versus online support. And I framed it around Alcoholics Anonymous. And actually, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I just started to see in 2004, five and six that chat rooms and AA and sobriety support was going online. And I was wondering about the efficacy because I went to church basements and drank coffee. And I know the fellowshipping, you know. So I proved, the research proved, and it was, it got, Pretty, I got some nice exposure. Uh, I proved that gathering together of any, it doesn't have to be recovery, but any kind of support group face-to-face -face is the way to go. And that online is great. And if there's nothing else, we should use it, but it doesn't have the same impact or sustainability. So when we all went into confinement and we all started doing all this online stuff, people were saying, oh, this must be killing you. I say, oh, I do say in the study, if there's nothing else, my concern is that as we move out, that we move back out and start connecting again. My concern is that the digital immigrant, the digital native, sorry, don't see the value of it. Yeah, that's that's so interesting, Don, because actually I was on a meeting this morning and we were talking about they were talking about uh, the family, how the, the recovery family is like such an accepting place, whereas maybe my family of origin was difficult. 
I mean, they were okay, but, but now my recovery family, like where it's loving and accepting and they help people. And I was telling people, I'm like, you know, it's great. It's great to be on a zoom meeting. It's great to be on a phone meeting. You need to go back to your home meetings in your hometowns because that connection is so key. And uh, I went to a meeting last night and it was like packed, you know, the treatment centers were all there and it was like, there was no seats and we were still wearing masks, but, um, but it was, it, it felt good. You know, it felt good to be home. So different than being on a phone call with, you know, 20 people. Yeah, this is, um, you know, and this is another conversation maybe, but I wrote a couple of articles that was very kind to be invited to contribute. Uh, and I was looking at just in terms of recovery, I, and I wrote about the difference between face to face and, you know, brick and mortar in real life, uh, meetings and online meetings. And one of the, I, I had a lot of concerns. Certainly I love that we can be connected and I got to go to meetings all over the world. It was great. And it got us through, but I worry about some things, certainly the ability to be of service and also the newcomer. And cause how uh, the fellowshipping is important, but again, that's another thing. And I, I wrote that, you know, I, I did that investigation, just my thoughts about it. But in terms of now and in terms of, um, you know, how we're going to move forward, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. But it's making sure that we don't become so invested in online things. And like I said, there's people who resisted shopping. Oh, uh, you know, there's things that I'm afraid we've lost um, besides scrapbooks and photo albums and writing letters and thank you. You know, people might think those are silly, but I, I pay attention. And um, there's a few things that I'm concerned about. I don't think that Nicole Kidman needs the money. I could be wrong. I don't know. But I started seeing her doing commercials for AMC. And I don't know if you've seen those. No, I haven't. And I started thinking why, and I went, Oh my goodness, because it's the death of the movie theater, because we all now learned how to stream and, and screens for watching movies and, and media are going to be, they already are huge, but they're going to be our whole walls. So I see that there's trying to be a thing of, remember, don't forget about the movie theater. Malls, malls are just an endangered species because people have just learned it's called Amazon. So the idea of gathering places and places where we come together as human beings, we're social animals. And so we used to gather, you know, around the, the fire back, you know, in the old, old early days. And then we gathered in the town square or the churches or, you know, we came to town on Main Street and, or we came together for picnics. And then it, as we move forward, fast forward, like when I was growing up, we hung out at the mall. It's where we gather. So, so I'm we. looking at the <laughs> gathering places for humans. Where are our watering holes? And what concerns me is because we do need that face-to-face -face connection, in my opinion, and my research proves it. And there's many studies that talk about how important that human connection is that's in real life. Uh, I worry about where are our gathering places? They're now Zoom. Yeah. And that, to me is very frightening. And once augmented reality, especially virtual reality and AI become more mainstream, which again, we knew it was coming, but because of the pandemic and forced need, it's a lot of things have been accelerated. Once we go into Ready Player One, I'm worried we won't come out of it. So where are going to be our in real life gathering places? And also when we're in our in real life gathering places, which has been something, this, this point I've been talking about for a long time, we are still on our devices. We're in what I call absent presence, meaning we're in a gathering place where there are other actual human beings in corporal presence and we're, Immediately, we're all in absent presence on our devices and we're missing organic bits for connection all over the place. So that's something I talk about a lot, the difference between being in absent presence or present presence when you are in a real space, in a, in a gathering place, at our watering holes as human beings. And that's something, you know, these are the things, <laughs> again, please forgive, these are the things, just a few of the things that keep me up at night. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I know you've done research on like good digital citizenship and, you know, guidelines, whether mm -hmm. it's for professionals or um, mm -hmm. teenagers, you know, what are your thoughts on that as far as guidelines to stay right sized or appropriate? Sure. This one is a little simpler to me. So with kids, when parents ask me this, because we don't know what's going on, what they're doing online, you know, and I'll tell you, 
I try to keep ahead of this every day. It's a lot of work. Uh, but state of the art in the morning with technology is obsolete by noon. And I work with kids and I work with teens and I have a treatment program uh, through Newport Healthcare in Santa Monica that treats teens and families. Uh, <laughs> I tell parents who ask me all the time how the, 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 the good digital citizenship, and to me it's simple, early and continually. I think that the baseline is, the expectation is to the kids that you will behave online the same as you would in real life. So our values, whatever your family is, whatever your values, your thoughts, your expectations of how to behave when you're actually in real life, I feel those should be the same online. Now there's something called the online disinhibition effect. Have you ever heard of that? It's okay if you haven't. This is I one have of those geeky a... things I geek. Yeah, it sounds cool. Right. So the, yeah, well the online disinhibition effect has been around for a while. And what it means basically is behind the protection of a screen like we're doing right now, or texting, you know, things that are, are digital communication. Online disinhibition means that we'll be more disinhibited when we're protected by the screen in the veil of cloaked communicated media, mediated communication, meaning that we're more apt to say and do things online and behave in ways protected by the screen that we would not do in real life if someone was in front of us. Now, I wanna make it clear, there's some really good parts about this. People are exploring, certainly recovery. You know, I was very, I would, I would love to say I went happy, joyous and free into my first meeting. I didn't go happy, joyous and free into my thousandth meeting. And I had a lot of things about that. I'm not gonna lie, I have to be honest and there's witnesses anyway. So it's not like, you know, there are people who saw this. Uh, so for people who are, and I call it the magic, am I or am I not? So. For people, and certainly I promote, let's make it clear, my research is behind it, face-to-face -face connection. And being, but being in real life, but, and I should say, there are some really cool ways for people who aren't sure. And when I say the am I or am I not, it can be am I or am I not having to do with addiction, sexuality, gender, Poly, it can be anything. If you're trying to explore something, but you really feel a little awkward or you don't really know that you could walk into a space with other people, being able to investigate that through the online disinhibition effect is not a bad thing as long as you're safe and there's not predators coming at you, right? Right, right. However, it can also be used in dark ways, certainly with the kids cyberbullying, I think if anyone's online, we've all seen these troll threads where people come at us or come at people, cancel culture, certainly. Uh, people will say and do things online and have you know disingenuous profiles. So that's where it gets a little tricky. So for kids, mm -hmm. whatever your family feels, how people should be treated in person, that's how I feel that you should have the same expedition online. You were what the thing you were talking about about uh, professionals. So I'm, I'm very grateful. You know, I've worked on this for a long, long time. It's been 14 years now, and the American Psychological Association has been very supportive of my work all the way. They were the ones with the study where I basically made I proved that Alcoholics Anonymous, especially, and other support groups are face-to-face -face are the best and strongest way. There's not, they're not the only way. There's lots of ways, and I'm not trying to tell anyone how to do that. But they, APA has been really great with me. And so they created the Device Management and Intelligence Committee. And Dr. Joanne Broder, who's my writing partner, was the president of uh, Division 46, which is the Society for Media Psychology and Technology. Uh, and she... Uh, and they, they created the Device Management and Intelligence Committee, which is part of APA and part of the division, which is great. We've been able to really do some cool things. Um, I am very grateful that this year I am actually the president of APA Division 46. And certainly it's, it's, it's really cool um, to have come to this place after I think about when I was just trying to be a good dad to my daughter. But it, I've got a lot of things because it's post-pandemic that I'm very grateful as president, I get to try to help people with. However, 
One of the things that concerned me regarding professionals, and again, if anyone's online or in any social media, I don't think I even need to go and explain. We've all seen things that we say, oh my goodness, oh, ye, oh, awkward, or something that's very disclosing. We're so busy trying to harvest affirmation, likes, followers, shares, hearts, from people, most of whom we really don't know if we're honest. I try to remind people that because we're so busy looking at that, we might forget about the people who are out there, who are making judgments about our posts, the way we write, typo or, or grammar problems, all kinds of things. They might be making judgments we will never know. Mm -hmm. Because we we're, we don't look at that side. We only see the affirmations. We're so busy trying to, to harvest. So I just remind professionals, especially, and everybody, but professionals, that you could lose opportunities. And again, free speech, do whatever you want. Um, I have people who call me and say, hey, should I post this or can you read this? But I'm going to show you something because this is a pretty good example as far as professionals. Yeah. Doctors and clinicians cut out, still, if there's even magazines, does not mean to have magazines anymore? Oh, they cut out the uh, address, yeah. Cut out their yeah. Cut out the address. Why'd they do that? Because people will go find them or rob them. Because it's privacy, right? Yeah. So, yes. So professionals or, or in, in offices, they'll cut out their address. Yet these same people are posting everything online, where they are, where their kids go to school, where their house is. I really, I say to people, okay, I love that you went on vacation. I'm super FOMO. I've got fear of missing out. I really wish I was on vacation, but you might want to wait until you get back from your vacation before you start telling the Digiverse that you're out of the country for two weeks and then you come back and your house has been robbed. But it's also just protecting ourselves and protecting our reputation and also our brand. And also if we're affiliated, on social media uh, and we promote and, and, and any organization, we better make sure that whatever we're posting is aligned with the ideology of that organization. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, so we, I been concerned in looking at this for a long time. So what we were able to do with uh, my, uh, with uh, the, the device management and intelligence committee, and we've been work we worked on it for about six years, is that we started looking at some guidelines. They are not rules. They're not regulations. They're just suggestions from my committee, uh, Dr. Uh, Broders and my committee, of how professionals might want to look at engaging online. So we came up with, I don't know, I'm making this up, 80. And then over the years, we distilled them down. We edited them. We peer reviewed them. And we came up with a final 12 guidelines suggested for professional engagement online. And 12. when we were kind of coming with how many. Yeah, exactly. Thank the you. magic number. We're coming with how many. Well, for us, uh, but we came, we're trying to come up at the very end after we had them peer reviewed and, and how many were we going to do? And so my committee, they said the number that was right, 10. It's a good number. It's a round number. And there could have been 10. I said, <laughs> why don't we do 12? And the committee, my committee members, oh, like a dozen, like 12. I'm like, yeah, like a dozen. Yeah. Wink, wink. <laughs> uh, only people who know, know why I, I, because it's my committee. They're like, oh, of course, of course, of course. Right. I got to leverage and flex on that a little bit. But only those who know, know why I wanted to do 12 APA recommended, suggested guidelines for professional engagement. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a cool project. Yeah. 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 So, Don, this is very interesting, you know, and you've been talking about a lot about devices, social media, uh, things like that. What about gamers? I know there's a lot of people out there that are they play games, they live stream their games on Twitch. They spend all day long on it. Um, is that a problem as well or not so much? Well, look, nothing's a problem unless it's a problem. Right. So what I look at is the same because. Uh, my background is an addiction. You know, I became a, I was a drug counselor before I was a psychologist. So just to blanketly say anything is a problem, that's not fair. I do it this way. So when I hear there might be a problem, I treat it the same way as when I assess for, is there a problem with substances? 
And I do it this way. I really carefully investigate, is this behavior, whatever it is, it can be anything, it can be golf. Is this behavior, suddenly all the golfers say, wow, where'd that come from? Sorry, I just used some, I made it up. Just, <laughs> I can see it. I can't see it, but yep. I'm thinking. Uh, does it, is this behavior, does it negatively impact, impede, subjugate, or, or at all negatively uh, influence? Biological, psychological, sociological, career or academic, or environmental health. So I look at all of those the same as I do assessments. And I wrote instruments uh, of assessment for uh, device use. And I look at all device use, you know, whatever, social media, it's gaming, all, all of the things. And I wrote those instruments based on my background and experience in working with so many instruments to assess if there's a substance issue or an addiction. So ba basically to me, it's the same thing, Derek. It's, and if I find that whatever the behavior is, for example, gaming is impeding biological. For example, we, that looks like uh, the gamer is really their, 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 their weight and is, has changed in not a good way that's healthy. Their socialization, well, let's go biological. Their, their, you know, their body has changed. Um, they have carpal tunnel, they have eye strain, they have back strain, you know, I'm making up a few. Psychological, are they completely, you know, the cortisol and, and dopamine and adrenaline that's all that's flowing through a long-term gamer's brain, is that causing anything? Are they depressed? Are they have anxiety? Sociological, have they divested all of their friends and they're sitting in their basement, you know, gaming for a week? Academic, are they not? Are they doing poorly in school because they're gaming and not doing their homework? Our career, are they gaming at work or are they too tired because they're up all night on these, you know, playing a, a three-day run a fortnight? Uh, I look at these things. Environmental, is it something that's causing problems or financial? You know, I look at these things. And then we talk about it. And if it looks like the behavior, for example, gaming is unhealthy or impacting in a negative way some other part of your life, what do you want to do about it? That's how I look at it. And so for gamers, I'm not going to say gamers. And I'm not, and I, the gamers is a whole different animal. Um, I've heard, I've heard stories that I believe, but that are unbelievable about parents. And, you know, they're trying to get the PlayStation or the Xbox away from their kid and the kid bites them or, you know, and, you know, they're, so that's how I look at it though. Whatever your online engagement is, I treat it the same way as anything because it can be considered in the, in the line of what we call a process addiction, mm -hmm. even though the digital things are not addiction yet, but we're trying um, online gaming disorder is something that a uh, task group uh, that that has been working run by Dr. Jug Gentile, who has been working on this forever and some other people. And I was fortunate enough to be able to be a part of this a little bit, uh, trying to get the gaming in the DSM, which is the diagnostic, you know, the, the, the manual for psychology. Mm -hmm. So it's now in its fifth edition. So trying to get online gaming disorder in the next one. So it is actually a legit diagnosis. To be honest, because I'm transparent and truthful, I don't sugarcoat. We're trying to do it because then insurance will pay for it, right? right? Yep. Pay for treatment. The rest of the world has, the World Health Organization in 2019, they, they said this gaming is a thing. We're a little behind in America. I, my prediction is it's, if it makes it, which I hope it will, it will not be online gaming disorder, it'll just be gaming disorder. But we'll start there and get a foothold because people who call anything behaves with, with um, devices addiction, it's not legitimately identified as an addiction yet. So we're careful. I can call it dependence. That's why I call it healthy device management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, even like countries like China, I know has limited, I think it's one hour of gaming if you're under 18 years old and uh, they've limited it, which, you know, is high control. Um, Asia but is very... <laughs> yeah, sorry. Asia has been on top of this. A few years ago, I was trying to go and do a fellowship at the University of Hong Kong to do a research study that I'm working on. But I really wanted to go there because I follow what's going on and I'm, I'm geeky and I read research and the stuff that's coming out of Asia is really ahead of us. And I wanted to be a part of that mix because I've been very fortunate in this country. Uh, 
and I've been able to do a lot of things, but I want to go learn from people who know more. I want to be in that mix and end up instead getting an opportunity to open a treatment center for kids in Santa Monica. So I, I took that. But uh, there's certainly like South Korea. South Korea has been kind of battling back against the gaming and the cyber cafes and all of that for a long time. China trying to limit, uh, China also has some restrictions on some of the social media things, but for example, <laughs> restricting an hour, who really knows? Uh, TikTok, which is the social media of choice now, is a Chinese-based application. So I, I'm not quite sure what's going on over there with the limiting of hours. I yeah. know that uh, South Korea has been on this and, you know, they closed the cyber cafes that the kids used to go to after school forever. And then they limited the hours of it. Um, but, yeah, it's just interesting to me that putting yeah. limitations, but then TikTok, I, you know, okay, you only have an hour at TikTok. Well, let's, and that's, let's, I think, 59 minutes too much. Let's talk about TikTok. You know, so my kids are on TikTok. They spend all day on it. I've seen it. I mean, I know it's uh, it's growing. It's very popular. Does it have value? And is it harmful? That's um, okay. Nothing is harmful unless, like I said, it causes... I'm all about entertainment value. So I'm fair. Derek and the kids could have a point. They could argue, well, I spent, you know, three hours watching TikTok. Well, that's three hours too much. They'll come right back at us, Derek, and they'll say, really? Because you came home right after work and spent three hours watching sitcoms or drama. You went right in front of the TV or football or whatever. That's our entertainment. Okay. Uh, the history is a little tricky. TikTok came at the right time because YouTube, and I'm not going to go into, I mean, it's, it's, it's public knowledge. It's easy to look up. And a lot of your listeners may already know. So YouTube used to be where creators would go to make videos and get exposure. But then YouTube got bought by another big social media company and the creators kind of got marginalized. And YouTube became more for the, the, the big stars. And so the creators who were trying to put their work up there, you know, it wasn't as, as, uh, much exposure, wasn't as financially um, um, compensating for them. So we knew, those of us who kind of do this, uh, we were waiting, we were trying to see where was gonna be the next creator platform for videos. And then TikTok arrived. The contrary to TikTok was last year, who's gonna buy it, how are we gonna regulate it? It comes out of China and there was all, now we're still not sure, but what's been going on now in the Wall Street Journal, and I really encourage your listeners or your watchers to look this up, the Wall Street Journal uh, last couple months ago did, it, it's a video, it shows how TikTok works, how the algorithms work. And what's really fascinating, but also a little concerning, uh, and they show how they do it, is within about eight clicks on videos, TikTok algorithms know more about us than our partners. They know our preferences, they know how we, how we what we're interested in, there's a way, and you can watch the video, it's really well done. I like it a lot. I show it to the kids in my program. Okay. Uh, and, but if you start looking at a certain kind of thing, especially the dark things, self-harm, suicide, the way that a TikTok, the way TikTok works is it will take you and start only migrating you toward those videos. And to walk it back and get back to the ones with puppies jumping all over each other is very difficult. It's, it's very difficult to get, to move back into the main area it takes you out on like i just described it as a peninsula where just the dark stuff is uh, i was doing some interviews about that um kids were diagnosing themselves on tiktok so they were all getting into these tiktok videos and starting kids were just adopting diagnoses which may or may not be true but through tiktok videos um there's so much controversy around tiktok it's um it's something i think for entertainment sure but when you start having impressionable young minds whose frontal cortex is not fully formed, they're having identity issues, they're coming out of a pandemic, they're trying to connect, they want to be cool. Uh, I mean, <laughs> forgive me, this influencer phenomenon, I would probably have a lot, and I am saying this, and I, would, I do say this face to face, so I'm not hiding behind this video, because I've said this in front of people, I say, okay, I get it, 
I get the influencer thing. I mean, I, I get it, but uh, back in the day, digital immigrant, uh, we used to call them posers. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that someone just decides that they are influencers of what, and the shelf life of an influencer, as you, if you watch, is like 10 minutes. I was joking that I would like to see them do one of those things. Where are they now? Like we do, where are the Brady Bunch kids I'm dating? Where are the kids from different strokes? Where are they? You know, where are they now? I, I'm sure, I'm sure that'll happen. Say, yeah. I'm so sorry, influencers. And one of my best friend's child, who I love, who's like a godchild to me, is actually a successful influencer. But I, I tease her about this. I want to do like a mock expose, maybe for SNL. Influencers 2021, where are they now? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of the Does number one. Like it's like yeah, it's one of the number one career options. If you ask a teenager, where do you want to be? A lot of them want to be influencers. That's what they aspire to. Uh, on my assessment, my instrument assessment, my general one that I wrote uh, about devices, trying to, when I work with kids and I just do it to find out if there's anything, one of the questions is about who would you want to be an influencer? It's always like, oh my God, of course. Okay. Well, what do you want to be like six months after if you become successful? They don't know. Um, <laughs> Ex influencer. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, if you parlayed into something, I mean, that kind of exposure, I mean, the Kardashians made an entire, I mean, who were they? They made an entire empire out of it. So if you parlay that into something else, and that's what I'm talking to my friend's child, and she's already got a plan, taking it as a launching platform and using it because, yes, there's companies that would be interested in that. If you have 2 million or 3 million followers and you can, teach, you know, you wear their products. I mean, that was it's called a spokesperson back in the day. So if you can take it and not use it for drama, but then actually use it to get exposure and maybe you could get a talk show or maybe you could, you know, and I don't know, but there's so many influencers. I don't know quite what the criteria is, but when we look back, where did most of them end up? You know, right. talking about that in 2020, they were the top influencer. Right. So yeah. using it though for exposure and using it to, as a jumpstart to something else, that's great mm -hmm. Go for it. Yeah. So, so Don, let's talk about, uh, I know you mentioned some terms like what's the difference between comparing and despairing or then doom scrolling. These are some terms people throw out gonna, about social. I'm going to ask you. Yeah. I'm going to ask you, what do you think comparing and despairing means, Derek? Yeah. Well, I, it sounds, in terms of social media. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, those perfect Instagram posts that my friends post when everything is just right and beautiful and their lives are perfect and they have great vacations, beautiful cars, beautiful families, all these things. Mm -hmm. And then I compare, right? Well, I compare. You deal. Yeah. Well, I think it forces comparison and uh, I try not to do it. You know, I try and be more aware of it, but yeah, it makes you question, you know? Right. So here's because we want solutions, right? My advice, my suggestion, do what you like. I think for social media, it's fine. 15 minutes in and out. If you're spending more than 15 minutes, what do you do in there? It's not. And the studies that have been coming out have shown the pre and the post test. Your emotional feeling before you go on social media and after, never. The outcome is if you're the longer you're on it, you know, the, when they do and look at the, uh, your emotional state afterwards, the dysregulation is profound. So comparing and despairing. Yeah. So I'm looking at your social and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at Derek's life. Derek is on this great vacation. He shouldn't post those pictures till he gets back as I've already suggested, cause he's going to come back and find his house Rob. Uh, he's got a great car. Look at his beautiful family. Look at everything he's got. Look, his life is so wonderful. Wow, my life sucks. Like I never go anywhere. I work all the time. I'm not going on vacation. Wow. And you start despairing. Now, what we have to remember, social media is all self-constructed. It is completely at the discretion of the creator. It is kind of like our storefront window in a store. It's our store. We are the curators. And so whatever we're putting out there, is up to us. There's no oversight. And I will tell you, I'm not saying that people who post aren't all true, but I know too many cases of people whose life online that is false. What you see, and I, I don't trade in gossip. I work in this field. I have people who call me and ask me, and their social media life looks like they are 
crushing it. And they, their real life is in shambles. There's also a correlation that's been established. The more you post on social media, the less life satisfaction you have. So there's an, it's called an inverse correlation. So the more you post, chances are the less life satisfaction you are. Um, I, uh, and, and when I do presentations, I've always include this slide three times, at the top, middle and end, because I want people to think about it. And it's my thesis for social media. I don't know about you, Derek. My friends know what's going on in my life. My little circle, they know. I right. share with them, they know what's going on. I know what's going right. on in their life, right? So I have no problem with po people posting or creating anything. And that's your right, right? But I wonder, what is your real intention? What is your motivation for posting anything? What do you need? And I use examples of some things that are a little out there when I do an actual presentation that are actual social media posts where people are just, it's like a cry for help sometimes. But I just wonder, and I say, look, I don't care. It's your choice. But before you post anything, what do you need? What do you want? What, do you, why, what are you looking for? Why do you need to post this? And so I want people to think about that before posting, because what we also have to remember, even if it's deleted, could have been screenshot, could have been saved, it's on a server, everything from the time we start posting is archived forever and being beamed out into space. Uh, I actually think that if there are aliens and they start seeing like life with the Kardashians being beamed up and they pick it out, they will avoid our planet. They'll be like, no, <laughs> no. No, we can just, that's, they leave them. Uh, sorry, not sorry. But we need to remember that. And I work with the kids because it's also our legacy. And we don't think about this because we're living in real time. Long after we're gone, our digital footprint will remain forever. It's our scrapbook. We are writing our own biography with images and thoughts. And so... We, I teach the kids that I work with, I say, okay, from the time you start creating your digital footprint, meaning you post your first thing, forever. Uh, it's interesting to me when I get sometimes a reminder, oh, your memories from this day, even I, I mean, I, I make mistakes all the time. So I will see something, your memories of, and I see something I posted back a few years ago on social media and I think, Don, oh my God, that is like the digital walk of shame. What were you thinking? I will tell you, since it's a recovery podcast and it's about me, I have thanked my higher power more times than I can imagine that they people didn't have phones and all of that back when, so you true. know, before August 26, 2001. Oh, my goodness. I can't even imagine what my digital footprint would have been like yeah. with the nonsense that, that I was up to. So I am really grateful that we didn't have it. But even if you don't have that issue... Everything we post becomes forever our legacy. It is, it is our autobiography that will exist long and forever after we do. And I also wonder what future generations, if you know, I happen to have grandchildren or great-grandchildren, and they decide what was great-great-grandpa like, what will they think about what not only I have posted, but what others have said and posted about me? Mm. Yeah, I, can, I think about these things and maybe no one else does, but I do. That's amazing. Yeah, that, that It's is, not just like, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be macabre, yeah. but instead of the way it is now seeing an obituary, you know, Don was a loving father blah, 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 and he did this. That's a one little paragraph. If anyone ever finds it, um, or on, if there is some sort of memorial stone or marker, you know, Don Grant, loving father, husband, all those things. Uh, uh, there is now a trail for decades of my legacy. And I'm really thoughtful of that and mindful, and maybe I'm being overly cautious. But the things that I posted, or if I was a 14 or 15 or 16 year old, or if I post in a bad mood, I use uh, the halt thing. I, one of the recommendations and the people who aren't in recovery will think, oh my God, that's like really great. Don't post if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And like, oh my God, halt that. I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, halt, don't. <laughs> And that's for people who, don't, who aren't in our world. Right. And I say that's just a basic thing. 
go. I, it's probably going to be a bad idea if you decide to post when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Right, right. Hey, so Don, I know uh, you're presenting a paper on attachment this summer at APA. Can you tell me a little bit about the research study about that, about attachment? I can, because I can now. This was the study that I was talking to you about. I was going to go to Hong Kong to try to do. So I have been concerned. It's just a hypothesis, but I've claimed it and I've already presented on it in public and I've written about it. So I can, nobody steal, please steal, please don't anyone steal this. Uh, but I'm working on the study because I don't know, but I started to look at um, attachment and I'm very interested in attachment. And if you don't know what attachment is, uh, there's two forms of attachment. It's all about relationships and it's insecure attachment or secure attachment with others, caregivers is where it starts. And certainly the goal is to have a secure attachment model as a child. During the developmental stages of attachment, which is very young, we attach to our caregivers and it helps us learn about trust and relationships. And the goal is that there's a secure attachment. And if we do have a secure attachment bond with our parent or caregiver, then we will probably be able to have healthy and good relationships throughout our life. If, however, there's some kind of rupture or the attachment is insecure for a variety of reasons, and I'm not going to go in, you can read about it, your, your watchers and listeners. Uh, and if there's an insecure attachment or there's ruptures in the attachment bond, then what we see is throughout a lifetime without us even knowing it. We struggle with relationships. We can't really make them work. There's insecurities because we don't have that secure attachment bond that was just blueprinted and, and hardwired into us. So there's that's already been established. It's a psychological theory, it's accepted, it's been around for a long time. Insecure, secure attachment. Within insecure attachment, there are a couple of different kinds of that. And I'm not gonna go into that, you can look that up. I started getting nervous because I, I observed and I started seeing for years now, I'm watching as caregivers and parents, and this is not a judgment, their child, is trying to get their attention and they're on their device is the long and the short of it. And the kid is saying, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, caregiver, caregiver. And the parents like one minute, it's this, it's the one minute or one minute. And I see it all around. And I, so I started to wonder about it. The same as I wondered about, you know, back when was online, very face-to-face -face support going to be a thing. Cause this is all nascent and new, right? So we're learning, but I started looking, I went, Oh, wow. So I started, thinking we might be seeing a new kind of insecure attachment disorder where it's device driven. And it goes back to that absent presence. What it means is that the caregiver is, is there in corporal presence, but they're an absent presence because they're on their device as their child is trying to get their attention. Now the message to the child is what? If you're trying to get mommy, daddy, caregiver's attention, Derek, and the parent is giving you this, the message to a little child who's in developmental stage of attachment, what is their, what is the message they're receiving? Yeah. We don't care about you. You're not important. I had a close colleague of mine actually come to me a few years ago when I had already started working on this and said, and she is a brilliant clinical psychologist, loving mother and wife. She's a great mom. And she said, Don, I think I might have a problem. I said, what? She said, my daughter just came to me and said, mommy, do you love your phone more than me? And the mother said, what do you mean? Well, because you're always on it and I try to get your attention basically. This is something I've been concerned about that the parent or the caregiver is no, has no intention. They're there, but they're on their device in absent presence. So the message to the child who's trying to form an attachment is, wait a second, wait a second, you're not important is what, it's not true. This, I'd already was working on this, Derek, and then we all started working from home. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is just gonna exacerbate it because we saw the Zoom bombings of, of kids, like try, and parents are trying to work and we see the kids and they're like, go away, go away. Or I imagined like mommy or daddy or caregivers trying to work at home and the kid doesn't know that. They don't know that mommy or daddy caregivers not at work, they're home. So they don't understand that. So they're trying to get mommy, daddy caregivers attention. Doors are being slammed. Parents are getting frustrated because on a call with their boss, shush up, go away. So those, I was 
already worried, and I, I'm just looking at it. There's just a hypothesis about it, but I thought, oh my gosh, during the pandemic for two years, the kids, the, these ch small children only see that their parents are home. So I had to start working with parents and saying, okay, you need to explain to your child, mommy, daddy is at, caregiver is at work. We're not at work, but I'm going in my, I'll, and give them time frames. come and check on them. Because otherwise, the message to a kid who doesn't understand is that they, because they keep getting pushed away because the parents were panicking as they're in meetings at work and the kids knock on the door or coming in and they're getting frustrated and embarrassed. And so they're, they're just, oh my gosh, go, go away and close. So that's what uh. I'm working on right now. And I hope I'm wrong, but anyone I've told this to says, I don't know that you're wrong. So this summer, uh, the, I worked on it and workshopped it and presented a little bit so I can claim it as, as my theory, uh, which as researchers is important. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm presenting it at the American Psychological Association Conference in, December, in uh, August. Okay. With, with a colleague of mine, Dr. Barb Nozell, who is the attachment guru. She's with Newport Healthcare. And so I explained this to her, and she's an attachment maven. And when I told her about it, she said, like, oh, my gosh, you're right. I think you're right. So she enjoined. So I brought her into it, and we're going to be presenting it. And the fact that it got accepted, I'm just going to say, if you don't know this world, to be accepted to present a paper or a theory at the American Psychological That's World big. Convention. Yeah. Well, it means I might not be wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing. I think that's I, what, I don't know. Just, that's important. That'll be in the Wall Street Journal. It will, yeah, it's important because if it is something that has legs, we need to get ahead of it and start telling parents so that they avoid it with their kids who are in that stage of attachment. Yeah, uh, but it's also with parents with teenagers. You know, forget the attachment bond has already been formed, but I talk to parents of teenagers. I'm like, how often do your teenagers even talk to you? But I've had teenagers who come and tell me, you know, my parents complain that I'm always on my device, but they're on it all the time. Okay. So the kids will tell me the one time they really decided to ask their parents advice, they had a breakup, they needed something. They've told me, They're, they say, okay, well, I tried. My parents said I never talked to them. I tried, I walked downstairs and they were on their iPad. Mom was playing Candy Crush. Dad was doing whatever he was doing. Everyone was playing Wordle. And my parents, I, I walked by or I said, I sat down and they were like, oh, give me a minute, give me a minute. I'll be right with you, kid. Parents may be missing organic bits for connection also when their kids are coming and actually talking. And at dinner, I, one of the basic rules that I say is you should, no one should have devices at the dinner table. I don't think there's going to be a zombie apocalypse in that hour or your company's going to fall apart. And if there is a zombie apocalypse, just if you stream The Walking Dead, we all know, just take the device and put it through their head. Don't go through their, it's the head. So, uh, and I don't think your company is going to completely collapse suddenly during the hour at dinner. So in meals, absolutely. There should be no devices for anyone at meals. And the devices when you're with friends or even at dinner should not be on the table because if it's on the table, it's on the table. And I talk about when we go out with friends and these are just small little, little, little tips that I suggest, take them or leave them. When we go out with friends and we have a plan to meet them face to face, coffee, lunch, dinner, don't put your device on the table, turn it off and stow it. Because if you put that device on the table, then the message to the other person is that, yeah, you're really important, but you know, if a better bid comes along. If you're with someone, be with someone in present presence. Put away your device. Do not just put it on the table. I equate it in real life to when you're at a party, and I've had this happen to me. I'm at a party and someone comes like, oh my God, Don, it's something to do, yay! And they're hugging me and talking to me, but I see them looking over my shoulder. Is there a better bid? Is there a bigger fish, a better bid? And it doesn't feel good to me. Yeah. So by putting your phone on the table when you're with friends, that's the message. And what happens is invariably you will get a text, you will get a call, and then you'll look at it. Really, it can't wait. You're with me right now. Yeah. But you'll take a better bid. Yeah. No, I think those are wonderful guidelines. I agree with no, no phone at the dinner table. Um, but tell me a little bit about speaking of guidelines, you know, some of this, uh, I know you started a PHP IOP program in Santa Monica, helping kids. Are you teaching kind of some of that healthy device management curriculum there as well? 
Yeah. I'm not, uh, I didn't, I had my own program and then COVID, unfortunately, I just couldn't keep it going. The efficacy, it just, I, it wasn't working. I landed in my own research, proved it. Uh, but then I got an opportunity from Newport Healthcare, which is Newport Academy is a treatment program center, a uh, treatment uh, uh, for kids, for teenagers. And they have residential programs. They have young adult programs. They have PHP and IOP. Uh, so when I had to close my program after COVID, I got a call from them and got invited to uh, open a Newport Academy, one of their uh, outpatient PHP programs in Santa Monica. And I didn't want to do it, but I talked to my sponsor about it. And when I closed my program, which was primary mental health, which is what Newport does, it's, it's, it's dual diagnosis sometimes, but it's really primary mental health, which is off the charts. Uh, anxiety and depression amongst teens was stabilized for decades, Derek. And then in 2002, we started seeing this weird, incredible increase in mental, in anxiety, so, uh, depression, self-harm, and suicide. And one is too many. And we couldn't figure out why. I had some ideas about it, but nothing's proven. And then in 2017, they replicated the study. This was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes about two years to analyze and clean data. In October of 2019, because I'm the geek who gets these alerts on my phone, oh, the study came out. I was hoping the numbers would be down. It's true. Sorry. Not sorry. Uh, they were higher. And that was pre-pandemic. We already know the pandemic because we're already seeing it caused even more potential mental health disruption, dysregulation, anxiety, depression, and as we reemerge. So I had the opportunity to open again with Newport. So uh, we opened Newport Academy Santa Monica, which is PHP IOP for teens. It's mental health. But yeah, I have a healthy device management curriculum I had in my old program that I teach and I brought it into the Santa Monica site. And the goal is because they have programs all over the country. It was one of the draws, certainly a big one. I will be able hopefully to take my curriculum across and train people at all the Newport Healthcare and Newport Academy sites and be able to help more people because I'm getting too old for this. I can't do it on my own. I'm glad that everyone kind of caught on and so are the people who, you know, uh, hold my student loans because I'm not going to default on those because I don't think I was wrong about this, which is good. Um, so uh, I have my curriculum. We're actually right now, we're the only outpatient PHP program for teens that has this curriculum. I've beta tested it over years. It's evidence-based. I've been working on it and changing it and making it current. Uh, so yeah, I do have that. Thank you for asking. Yeah, that's exciting. That's great. I think, you know, helping, helping the upcoming generations, helping the kids, uh, helping to break the cycle of addiction is, you know, important for me. And, uh, and this is all so new, right? So we need people that are pioneering out there, pushing and coming up with these theories. So I really commend you and thank you for all your research. I appreciate that. I yeah. actually, when you say that, one of my platforms as president of my division is the students because this is so nascent. There was only a few of us, not because we're any rock. Well, I think actually some of my mentors in this are rock stars. I'm big fanboy, but you know, there were just it's a new field. So there's just not a lot of media psychologists or people who work with this just because it's so new. But one of my platforms as president of my division are the students. And in fact, later this afternoon, I have a meeting with our student committee of our division and the people who, the girls who run it, the two, we call them the two Stephanies. They're both named Stephanie. They are just on fire and I am really invested in supporting. I do a lot of uh, educational support, but I really, really am trying to get younger people and students involved in this field because it is media psychology in general, I believe is a future. I mean, influencers aside and all, you know, all these, you know, but media psychology, if, when we see how much media and how it influences us and we're seeing it currently, how impacting it is fake news, real news. It can also do a lot of good things and spread information, but it spreads a lot of bad information. There's so much to media psychology that I really uh, support the students because I believe that it's going to be a career in the future that is even more vital as we start to media starts to become even more and more and more and more just trying to keep hold of it and help people with their reactions, responses, identify what is real, what is legit, keeping people safe online. It's a lot of bad stuff out there. Parents, uh, you know, I tell parents, 
you wouldn't let your kid, I don't think, who's eight, nine, or ten, go and say, "Hey, peace out. I'm gonna go out," and not say, "What? Where are you going? Who are you with? How are you getting there? Is there an adult there? Who else is there?" But these parents, and it's not their fault. I did it too. I told you the story. They they're letting their kids go online with no oversight. But I think that when someone asks me, why do you think the difference is? Because, yeah, that makes sense. You wouldn't let your kid just wander out and play with people you don't know. And certainly in the Digiverse, you have no idea who could be playing with your kid online, you know, do, you know, in, engaging. I said, I think it's because it's a weird phenomenon where the parent sees their kid in their house or in their home. So they don't think. They're not in your home. They're an absent presence in your home. They're off in some digital playground in a Twitch, you know, chat room or somewhere on a website. But I tell parents, just remember, they're not in your house, really. You need to know where they're going, who they're playing with. So those are also basic things for parents. Don't just let your kid go online. Know where they're going. Find out these sites they're on. Investigate them. Find out who's there. Talk to your kids about this stuff. And also remember, you're in control. You're paying for these devices. You're paying for the streaming services. You're paying for the apps. This is not just something that you kids just get. They all expect it. But it's like we used to think about a car. You didn't just get a car at 16. It was a privilege. And your parents paid for it. So they have control over how you use it. And you better use that car. I don't know about you or anyone else. When I my parents gave me that old car, which I love that old car, mm -hmm. there were rules. There were regulations. I had to take classes to learn how to drive it. I had to be saved. My parents checked. And if I didn't comply, they took away that privilege. And I say, so why do you think every kid should get the latest Apple iPhone at seven years old like it's an entitled thing? Of course, I give my kids and always did. But it's not you, the same as a car. But because we're digital immigrants and we're intimidated because we're insecure and we don't understand it and we don't want them to know that, we're afraid to ask them. So I tell parents also, just remember, these things are expensive, but it's the same. You're giving them a potential weapon. As I learn, taking it all the way back to the beginning, the hard way. And I really, um, you know, I didn't realize that just trying to be a good dad would lead me to be able to talk to people like you on places like this through platforms that are digitally supported, which is great. I didn't know that back then. But I'm really glad that, you know, I am able now to share my experience, strength, and hope with others. Heck yes. Yeah. And we'll, we'll end on that high note. Um, Dr. Don Grant, thank you for being here. I will have all your information in the show notes. So if anybody wants to follow up with you in your research and uh, thank you, sir. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Oh, Derek, I want my gratitude. Thank you so much for inviting me. I know, you know, I tell people and I might've warned you, don't put a Bitcoin in me because I am passionate about this. When you said, why are you passionate? I don't know. I just am. I also feel like I'm like Hamilton. I'm running out of time. I'm getting older and I will. We're the last digital immigrants. You know, <laughs> don't forget to write thank you notes. Write them real ones. So you ask why I'm passionate, but I really appreciate it because I know you put a Bitcoin in me and it's just like you can see. It's just go, 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 go uh, because there's so much to this, but I am passionate about it. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And uh, so thank maybe you. I'm making a living amends to my kid. I yeah. don't know from all those years ago. Hundred percent. I'm working on that too. Living amends. Um, so thank you for listening to the Recovering CEO. I've been a. Uh... You thought that you could have it all, and life could be a ball, but you fell and scabbed your knee.